got now a panel of two, so two experts sitting here up on stage, and we will kind of like round the media panel up with digging deep into the topic of how to finance media. We got here up on stage Laura Sophia Dornheim, who is public affairs manager at IO, and she's a digital strategy consultant and pretty much knows it very well about the entire topic. And next to her, we have Sebastian Lemons, who is the head of Blendl Germany. And as you might know, Blendl is a Dutch startup who is revolutionizing the old media industry by quite something big they do. So please give a very warm welcome to those two. Let's get them up here. <laughs> Hi. Hello, everyone. I, I think everyone is almost ready to run outside and grab a beer, but we will be um, here for 20 more minutes um, discussing, I think, a very important topic. Maybe it's good if we do a small introduction on who we are and what we do. Ladies we do first. That. We just sat on a panel three weeks ago, yeah. so we know each other. Um, <laughs> But uh, you should know each other to know us too. Um, so I work for IO. That's a company um, behind Adblock Plus. Um, Adblock Plus is an ad blocker. Who of you is using an ad blocker? Okay, I guess um, everyone. just by statistics, some of you are using Adblock Plus. Um, yeah, so that's our main product. But we also work on some other um, projects. Um, one of them is uh, Flatter Plus that... Um, helps uh, content creators, publishers, to monetize their content. So our idea is that there must be alternatives to monetize content, content online besides the classic advertising model, which is more or less failing or struggling. Um, and I guess that's what we have in common, trying to find ways to find money. Yeah, exactly. So what we do at Blendl is indeed exactly that, trying to figure out if there's another business model um, to fund journalism. So for those of you who don't know Blendl, Blendl is a, a Dutch startup. We started two and a half years ago with an online platform on which you can find pretty much any good uh, newspaper or magazine. So the Spiegel, the Süddeutsche, all of them are in there in this great digital platform. And our users can read them by an article and pay only for a single article. So you don't need a subscription which is quite common in, in the newspaper and magazine industry, if you don't buy the issue, but you just buy a single article. Um, so that's, that's basically the key feature, um, but what's also very important to the platform is that we really try to help you find these great pieces of journalism that are often hidden away behind a paywall or hidden away in a print magazine. Um, and we do this by having a great editorial team. Basically, every morning they stand up super, super early, four or five o'clock. They go through all the newspapers and the magazines um, and select the best, the best articles that they can find. And then our data team, so we have a team of almost 10 data scientists, then personalize this feed, this content feed, this feed of articles to you. So. Um, if you really are into sports, you get more sports article. If you're really into Spiegel, you get more Spiegel articles. So that way we really try to become more relevant for you and um, yeah, try to get you to read more of the, the great pieces that are out there. And maybe to add to that, I think Oliver von Verstod explained a bit about the issues that big publishing houses now have. Um, being the fact that um, the average newspaper subscriber is around 55 years old and getting um, one year older every year. So it's a, it's a dying species. So there is a, a definite need to find a way to get the younger generation also to realize and to figure out that like, hey, it's actually worth paying for a great piece of journalism. And that's, uh, that's what we try to do, yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, what you just said, so we need to find ways for younger people. And um, what I find, the, um, the, there's an interesting gap. On the one hand, newspapers, subscribers, people who pay for journalism are growing older. They mostly do it online, uh, offline. They don't really do it online. And then on the other hand, we have a growing user base online who 
has absolutely no understanding why they shouldn't pay online. I mean, uh, if I look to my nephews, uh, if I ask them, why do you spend money on stuff in Minecraft, they look at me like, why should I not? It's something I want, it's something I use, it has value to me. So, and the older generation sees digital as something that's not real, so they're not paying. So there is this like gap in between and there's very few solutions and Blend Light being one of them. But there's one thing I wanted to ask you. Um, how genius is your algorithm? Because last Thursday I it's, was flying it's, to it's Amsterdam. It's simple, yeah. It, no, there must be, so I was flying to Amsterdam to a conference um, and um, I was slightly tired because I have a little baby that uh, decided it has to party at 3 a.m. And I was getting in the plane and I still could use my phone, so I was scrolling through the Blendl suggestions. And then there it was, German Eltern.de, wie sie ihr Kind zum Schlafen bringen. I was like, you guys, like, I always complain about advertising, targeted advertising just not working because everything I see is just irrelevant to me. And then all of a sudden there was this one piece that I really wanted to read in this second and I was hoping to find solutions. Of course, the solutions are always... But this article was, um, I was fascinated. I, I think your algorithm is not so simple. Well, it must yeah, be super been, uh, sophisticated. Yeah, we following you and uh, trying to read your mind. Maybe now, actually, now it's quite rudimentary. So basically, the only thing we now base um, your newsletter. So if you are a Blendle subscriber, you, every morning you get your newsletter with the best articles. Um, we now base it on the publications that you read and on kind of the, we call them channels. So if you like football, if you like, um, um, what have you not, economics, history, that kind of thing. So the algorithm bases its selection on that. But that's just the first step. And so the, the data team is already getting, like we get in like 6,000 articles every day. It's, it's not a lot, but it's quite something. And what they do is they enrich those articles with all kinds of features, we call them. So what kind of, um, how long is the article? What is the article about? Who is the author of the article? Um, like um, metadata, basically. Exactly, all the metadata that you can gather, um, which gives more information than just uh, the headline of the article or whatever thing is still in there. Um, so that's one side. And then on the other side, we um, also become smarter and smarter on what our readers like to read. And so that's now something which is not, not fully up and running yet, but we're testing in beta, is combining those two worlds. So one by one, adding a feature to that list, making the personalization even better, even better every day, even better every day, yeah. But are you somehow tracking users? Are you using like Atlas yeah. features to like combine data from their Facebook usage no. or something? No. So do, do, do I have to worry about something that Facebook You're pixels and those kind of things. Yeah, like uh, no, we don't have that. Basically, the only thing we have is is your email address and your reading behavior, and that's I think um, also one of the key topics um, is to really well, if we maybe one step back. So what we try to do is get younger people to pay for something that they're no, not used paying for. I mean, journalism is for free, right? The news is for free. You can read it everywhere. Um, and this also used to be the case with uh, music, um, for example, which was heavily broken by first iTunes that came in and now Spotify. I mean, everybody has a Spotify account. And why um, does everybody have a Spotify account? Because it's basically very convenient. It's just an awesome piece of software. You get good recommendations and it's worth to spend 10 bucks a month on, on that while you can also go to YouTube or uh, an, an illegal channel to get your music. And the key thing in that is, is really convenience. If we compare that world to the current, and especially the historic, but still the current publishing world, it's very hard to buy content online. I mean, I'm not sure if one of you ever tried to get a digital subscription at basically any newspaper. It will probably take you five minutes, which is weird, right? Because if you go to a kiosk, you just Put, put down a euro and within four seconds you have that thing. But it's so, it's just so hard, so very, very hard to buy content online because you need to fill in uh, your name, uh, then you go to your email address, then you go to your uh, birth uh, date, then you go to your address. I mean, why would you need an address for a digital subscription? I don't know. And then, well, there's often quite a lot of other things that um, yeah, that the publisher asks. You always have to repeat your exactly. email address. Exactly, and then you repeat. So it's very hard. And all these steps is what we try to take away to minimize 
kind of the pain of paying, so to say, or to make the experience um, as good as it can be. And then second to that, what we also do is um, we've built in a mechanism where you can, if you didn't like the article, you can just ask for your money back. You just refund it. You just get it back. So you paid 50 cents, mm, article was not good, press the refund button, and there you go back. I was actually we thinking to do this this morning. I read, was, uh, you should. read the yeah. piece on the New York you don't Times. Like it. Yeah, but the problem is I had a moral issue there because I was reading this New York Times cover about the Trump interview, yeah. which was like, I was really disappointed. Um, and then I was like, but still, I want the New York Times to write articles. And if I want them to exist, I probably have to accept also that they sometimes write stuff that I am not so super excited about. So I decided, no, I'm actually like giving you the euro. No, I think, I think you should refund because okay, gonna do it's... It. It's, the, it's a very intricate way to give feedback, right? So if they, um, especially if, if, the, um, if it's only in print, it's very hard to know what people actually read. Yeah, they do surveys and they ask around. But this is very direct feedback um, on why you didn't like that article. Maybe it was too long, maybe it was not what you expected, it was too short, what, whatever the reason. Um, so you should do that. Yeah, okay. next time you should. I will do that. Um, I want to talk briefly about what you touched with the pain of payment because we also figured um, that's the main issue, right? I mean, all the, the newspaper, all the publishers, they at least by now wrap their head around they want to somehow have more revenues from digital. But they create these super painful processes. So what we're really trying to do I think what you're trying to, what, what Blender's doing is like you combine it in one app and you have access to everything. Yeah. And what we're trying to do with this Flatter Plus project is we're putting something in your browser that lets you pay wherever you go. But also something that where you actually don't have to interact at all. We have an algorithm that checks what are you reading, what do you like, where do you spend time, on what content. And based on that, we spend your money. But yeah, I think that's the really the big issue getting rid of that, not just the, the painful processes, but also the active decision. Because I think you do it in a very subtle way. I always see how much an article is, but I don't actually have to every time make a decision like, do I want to pay now? How much do I want to pay? Da, 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 da. I just don't have to think about it. So, and, um, so if, if we're successful with this uh, Flatter Plus project, um, I think that would, be, would cover two two sides, and I think this is really where people should go. There is no one solution, I feel, online. That's what the, the publisher, they're trying to find this like one subscription model online. No, this is, this is not analog. You don't have to have one subscription. You have technology, you have so many potentials to like actually give each different user, if you want to, a different way or different options how to pay for your content. Maybe some people are still okay with just ad financed stuff. Maybe some want to look at some ads and pay something. Maybe somebody wants to go through an app. So I think um, I'm hoping that there will be even more solutions to easily fund content. Yeah, definitely. I think there definitely will be more solutions. Um, maybe before I go into that question here on the screen, thanks for that one. I uh, come back to that. I had a question for you because you talking about that refund of that New York Times article, you touched a bit on this moral issue, whether you want to um, yeah, ask the money back from an institution that you find valuable because they create good content. How do you see that in, in, in your daily job, in your work? Because there's a lot of yeah, uh, fights with publishers on what you guys do um, compared to what they try to achieve bringing journalism to, to the world. So now we're talking about our, our uh, standing product, Adblock Plus, I guess. Um, yeah, so for those of you who don't know, Adblock Plus is the only ad blogger that has some sort of a compromise built in. So there's some advertising that we whitelist. Um, and um, it is the only way for people, for publishers to get ad revenue from people that block ads at all. So we think we do have a, if not optimal, but we do have a compromise there. Um, but yes, uh, publishers um, are, most of them, at least the German ones, the German ones are pretty furious, the, the international ones are mostly much more pragmatic, they think like, okay, there's a way how we can reach these people, let's do it. Um, the German ones, they have, for me, a 
difficult understanding of um, how advertising is their core business. And I would always hope that journalists don't think advertising is their core business. It's a vehicle, it's one business model, but um, they're kind of defending it at, as it's their, yeah, as it's um, what they actually want to do. Yeah, because it's their main revenue stream. So far it is, yeah. And instead of like, opening up their horizons and thinking about what else they could do, they cling to that even harder. And um, I had a uh, conversation with a uh, Scandinavian publishing house the other day and I was looking at some of their websites um, and before I saw the site, of course it deactivated the ad blocker, I had a full display blocking at like there was the whole, the whole screen. There was not even the headline, not even the title of the newspaper. The whole screen was a Volkswagen ad. Um, and I was just checking my head to think this is, this is not a solution, just making more and more advertising. So I hope you and me and some others, we can uh, wake them up and show them different solutions. No, I think but they're, they're waking up. Let's see, there's some um, questions for yeah, you. Yeah, there's, there's some interesting questions. Yeah, so on the refund rate, this is a very, very cool one because we can indeed quite nicely see which kind of publications have high or low refund rates. We can see what kind of topics have high and low refund rates. On average, it's 10%. Um, so, yeah, 10 out of 100 ask their money back. But it differs uh, hugely for the type of content. So, if it's more clickbait, gossip, like the stuff that you, or news news, like the stuff that you could just read for free online in any, um, in, on any website, people tend to refund that more, obviously, because it's not worth paying for. But the, um, like more investigative journalism, I mean, the, the good quality pieces where, from which it's really clear that a journalist or a team of journalists have spent a lot of time creating that story, then refund rates are, are far below 10. Um, so that's, that's nice. And it's also nice for the publishers also see their own refund rates for these articles. So they can use that feedback to, um, yeah, to see how people respond to their stories. Maybe then jumping right to the next question on in, in terms of revenue, in terms of money. So um, Blendl, we started off two and a half years ago in, in the Netherlands. Um, one year, roughly one year ago in Germany, we now have um, a million registered users, of which 20% is a paying user. So they topped up their wallet once. That's how it works. Um, in Germany, we're still um, quite a bit smaller than we are in the Netherlands. So the money that we make for a German publisher, uh, I mean, it's nice, it's additional, but it's not really significant. They wouldn't see it on their P&L. Well, in the Netherlands, where we are already um, a lot further in, in our growth, we see that actually, um, especially for some more niche but still um, well-known magazines, we really make the difference if there's like three more journalists uh, working. I mean, you can think of a new, big newspaper making revenues around half a million per year, on top of what they already have. And now again, of course, for a publisher, half a million is not a lot of money, but still. It's, um, it's additional, so it's good. You can um, fund quite some journalism with, with half a million. Um, let's see, there's even more questions popping up on the screen. Just uh, take the, the next one for you and then sure. I will do, do the legal stuff. I think that's for you. Is that for me? How much customers and viewers do we have? Uh, I can answer that also. I can answer. You, use it then also. you start and then I answer. Just yeah, so like I said, it's um, overall we have one, um, uh, actually that was in August, we, had, we hit the one million users. Um, and that's in the Netherlands, in Germany, and also in the US, by the way. So that's why you read this New York Times article, because we're also present in the US. Um, so in terms of customers, that's the number of customers that we have. In terms of viewers, it, it's... That um, depends a bit on what you mean with viewers. If it's active users per month or per year, I mean, we have, uh, like our newsletter is sent to more than three or 400,000 people. Um, so yeah, and also the active users are around that in a month. Yeah, I hope that answers a bit of the question, but it depends a bit on what you exactly mean. But you can come up to me after uh, the talk. 
Yeah, we have a little more users. So uh, I guess so. <laughs> Adblock Plus actually has a um, over 100 million uh, monthly active users. So just to put that into perspective, that's um, almost as many as LinkedIn has, um, or twice or three times, depending on the measure, as many uh, users as Tinder has. Um, so we are on, on, on a lot of machines. Um, obviously, right now, um, they're not spending any money for Adblock Plus. Adblock Plus is free and will always be free. Um, we uh, charge companies, we charge big corporations that have over 100 million additional ad impressions through our systems. We charge them a fee of uh, 30%. But for 90% of the, the um, websites that are free on our, web, um, on our whitelist, um, they uh, just uh, get in touch with us, it's a few emails, and then we whitelist uh, their websites for free. Um, yeah, um, don't worry, we will soon sue you. Come on, guys, really? Do you want to sue the, the, any kind of innovation? Do you think you will stop innovation by going to court? I really don't think so, but yes, please do so. Um, so far, all the lawsuits in Germany, we have won them. Every single lawyer, every single court says ad blocking is completely legal. Sometimes they have questions about our acceptable ads program, so that's the part um, where we whitelist ads and how we actually uh, make money. What are you money. going to do about that? What? What are you going to do about that? About the lawsuits? No, because they, <laughs> they will be there anyway. Yeah. Uh, but about the whitelisting, because I think that's the biggest issue, right? Well, so far it's still not uh, settled if there's any issue, even in Germany, where there's very uh, strict uh, laws and where some big corporations um, find some, some loopholes where they think they can use it um, against us. So there's no final decision yet. Uh, we're quite confident that this will not uphold. And also, the, so really to keep in mind is um, what happens if you sue Adblock Plus, if you sue the Acceptable Ads Program, and if you're lucky and some court uh, will banish it. Then what's left? All the other ad blockers. It's not like we're the only ad blocker, right? There's like about 200 small and bigger ones out there. So people will use these other ad blockers that have absolutely nothing built in to show any advertising whatsoever. We have this compromise where we say, okay, do your ads in a manner that doesn't annoy users, that's not too flashy, that doesn't have any filthy malvertising in it. Then we let it through our filters. So we try to bring these two sides, like the annoyed users and the publishers together. Of course, if you sue us, that's gone, and you only have ad blocking users. Ad blocking is growing, the ad blocking rate, there's countries where up to 40% of all people use an ad blocker. So um, from, a, from a user's perspective, I would say, okay, because that's the next step towards killing the advertising model at all. Um, but from a business side, from publishers, I think, um, be, don't be so emotional, don't cling to that advertising model so hard. Um, see the opportunities that are there and uh, figure out how you can work with them. And don't you feel a moral obligation to support that? Support what? Journalism. Well, that's actually what we do. That's what I try to explain. Like the Acceptable Ads program is the only way how anybody can make advertising revenues from users that have an ad blocker installed. But isn't then the issue that most of the money, it's about like if, where the money flows, right? So yeah, if but it still most of the money goes to the people that have the ads on their site. We charge for the service of working with them on figuring out what their ad models are, on listing these ads. Um, and I think, so if you look to, to uh, you probably know because you run an app, App Store and the Play Store, uh, they charge 30% for every yeah. money you make through them. Mm -hmm. So the, the ratio we charge, and again, we're only charging for the really big companies, all the, the medium and smaller ones are for free. Um, I think it's a fair share, and um, the majority of the money goes to the publishers. But still, yeah. they hate us for making money. <laughs> Apparently, they do. Um, any more questions from the crowd? No more questions. No more questions, good. See you in court. See you. Or, in, or in the bar. Me, not him. <laughs> good.